controversy over the Colonel Kemp affair um, is really the tip of an iceberg in terms of the <coughs> slow, or some would say, increasingly quick erosion of civil liberties in, in Australia, when you think that there are as much as 64 pieces of anti-terrorist legislation on the books. Jake, who is a focus of attention in this controversy, along with about half a dozen students and other people who were involved in the controversy at the lecture. Jake will try to be here later, he's got another commitment, but he wants me to say to all of you how grateful he is for the support you've given him um, over the past several weeks. I won't name them, but there are several colleagues on the bench here and in the, in the audience who've been amazingly gutsy but also highly sophisticated advocates for a sense of justice and without those qualities and that commitment we are all lost so Jake wishes me to uh, uh, express his gratitude in that respect and the the role of the the online journal New Matilda is also merits a mention because if well, it's it's made more of a dent in the conservative assumptions and often the laziness of the mainstream media than any other journal in my view. And so I hope for members at least of the audience of politics in the pub that new Matilda would become almost a first port of call if it hasn't been before. The topic is Colonel Kemp, Israeli army morality, uh, the right to protest and the University of Sydney as a judge and jury. Now, the two speakers have both been involved in what Paolo Freire called the conscientization of people, making people far more aware than they would otherwise have been about the issues. On Michael's right is Dr. David Brophy from the History Department of Sydney University, who, uh, along with his colleague uh, Nick Reamer, has been absolutely crucial in all sorts of journals, um, uh, electronic intifada, for example, to raise the awareness of people not only in this country but overseas as well about this particular controversy which is part of in many ways of what the Israeli government calls their Hasbara, their campaign to dramatize their virtues and to completely cover up uh, their abuses. Now preparing for this talk I wasn't sure whether tonight I'd be declaring victory uh, in the campaign to defend Jake Lynch uh, and the students being targeted, <clears throat> or whether I'd be sounding a call to arms to, to escalate that campaign. And, and as it turns out, uh, it's neither uh, tonight. We're still waiting to see what move management uh, will make next, whether it decides to continue with its prosecution uh, or not. Whatever the outcome of the camp affair, I think we can safely say that it will be crafted and presented uh, in such a way as to avoid clarification uh, of the issues involved. So um, tonight, instead of rehearsing all the details of the case, um, like Michael, I'd, try, I'd like to try and draw out some of those uh, issues. Uh, I'm referring here to, in particular, to the vexed concepts of academic freedom, intellectual freedom, uh, and uh, alongside these two siblings, uh, freedom of speech. There are questions here that are absolutely central to the functioning uh, of a university, but tend to lie dormant uh, until moments of crisis such as this, uh, in which strongly held views on either side tend to obscure the possibility for debate uh, and refinement uh, of our ideas here. Now, in recent years, these concepts have been enshrined legally and, and contractually in ways that they were not uh, previously, um, but they still mean different things to, to different people. So, to start then with just a potted history uh, of that process, uh, em employment contracts for academic staff at Sydney University um, in the first half of the 20th century were rather cursory uh, documents, basically offering professors tenure uh, on condition uh, of an indeterminate notion of, of good behaviour. Uh, Sydney was relatively liberal uh, in this respect. It wasn't unknown in the early 20th century for such contracts to include things like um, that we would now see as restrictions on our civil liberties. Um, some made it a condition of employment, for example, that um, staff not belong to a political party or engage in um, party political activities, things like that. 
After the Second World War, most of these clauses disappeared. Um, and it wasn't until the late 20th century that these questions um, emerged again. Can't, I'm sort of... I'll turn that up a bit more. The trick is being shorter. Yeah. Maybe if I just hold it. Yeah. Is that, yeah. That'll be better. Um, one of the reasons for this was that um, universities were now imposing more uh, explicit obligations uh, on staff to engage in research, uh, requiring universities in turn to create the necessary conditions uh, for such research. The 70s and 80s also saw significant changes to industrial law leading to the introduction of, of the award for academic staff in 1988. Um, now the, the shift to the award arguably involved a weakening uh, of tenure for professors, which I think has been another factor in the codification of expectations on, on academics. The award itself had no explicit definition of academic freedom. It simply defined misconduct and the uh, dismissal processes. Uh, in the 1990s, enterprise level agreements supplanted the award, and sometimes these did include clauses on, on academic freedom. Some of these clauses uh, were quite strong. Um, among the most robust was the University of Adelaide's clause, uh, which noted, among other things, quote, that academic staff should not be hindered or impeded in their right to contribute to social change through freely expressing their opinion of state policies and of policies affecting higher education. Uh, after listing other principles, uh, it concluded by saying staff, quote, can best do justice to these principles if the environment in which they operate is democratic and collegial. Now, Sydney didn't initially go down this path. Um, instead, we got a code of conduct, which is first dated to 1997, that defines appropriate behaviour for staff and students. Um, the code doesn't mention academic freedom, um, obliging us simply, quote, to pursue critical and open inquiry in a responsible manner. Um, since then, we've also acquired uh, what's called the public comment policy, uh, which I note in passing requires me to uh, indicate unambiguously this evening that I'm expressing my personal opinion here uh, and not presenting the opinion or position of the university in case there was any doubt uh, about that. <laughs> the, uh, so the preferred official notion of academic freedom is represented by the Senate-approved Charter of Academic Freedom in which the emphasis is very clearly on the freedom to research and publish in one's field of disciplinary expertise. Uh, it concludes with a vague clause about the, quote, principled and informed discussion of all aspects of, of knowledge and culture, but that's clearly secondary to the document. Now, as it happens, I think this is enough to mount a very strong defence uh, of Jake Lynch, uh, who I'm happy to see is, is here tonight. Jake's case is somewhat simplified by the fact that by any reasonable estimation, discussing solutions to the Israel-Palestine conflict uh, falls within his field of expertise, of, of peace and conflict studies. And so when required to, university management has defended him uh, on that basis. Uh, in 2012, when uh, Jake refused to support Dan Avnon's fellowship application, management said that, quote, he was entitled to express a public opinion where it falls under his area of expertise. This was a noticeably narrow statement in two senses. Uh, it does restrict his field of freedom to his particular area of expertise, but it's also strange in that it refers to expressing an opinion uh, as opposed to uh, what he was actually doing, participating uh, in a boycott. Academic freedom, I'd like to suggest, is much more than simply the right to express uh, opinions. I think it contains the idea that universities should be a place for the free exchange of ideas, and that this implies a critique of a wider society, that the public sphere is not always such a place. So in order to fulfill this stated function, university leaders should not simply defend individual scholars' um, right to express opinions, but be vigilant in diagnosing and counteracting the forces at work outside um, its walls that prevent the free interplay uh, of ideas. So this freedom I'm, I'm suggesting is not just defended reactively, but created proactively too. Um, so government influence is obviously one such pressure to be um, conscious of. Politicians and the elite don't like it uh, when scholars don't seem to take their ideas seriously. Uh, and they find ways to insert them in into the uh, academy. The $4 million grant to Bjorn Lomborg's 
think tank is a, is a good example of that. Now, scientists generally feel that well-funded climate denialist think tanks have severely distorted the scientific record to humanity's detriment and should not be given space uh, on campus. So, in taking that money, the University of Western Australia was not living up to its commitment to academic freedom, uh, in my book. Lobbying may equally constitute one such pressure. Does the role of the Israel lobby distort the discussion of Israel-Palestine in wider society? If so, what measures should the university take to prevent those distortions influencing debate uh, on campus? If it is the case, uh, as I believe it is, that accusations of anti-Semitism serve to stifle criticism of Israel in public discussion, then the university is obliged to treat with caution accusations of anti-Semitism directed against proponents of a BDS. And clearly in this case they did not. They announced to, what is it, the 30,000 staff and students um, almost immediately after the event that there were, quote, concerns with anti-Semitism uh, on campus, um, concerns that have not been publicly dispelled, launched a very slapdash investigation that it misleadingly described as independent, uh, and applied the code of conduct in a punitive fashion that is uh, without precedent. So far from standing up to it, the university is facilitating the distorting role of the Israel lobby, making its presence felt on campus. And in doing so, I would suggest, is conniving in attack on academic freedom. So I think we can mount a defence of Jake in this case on the basis of academic freedom. But what about the rest of us, though? Uh, people like me, who can't claim um, scholarly expertise uh, on the Middle East conflict. At a stretch, I could claim expertise to sufficient to comment on the um, university's decision to uh, cancel the lecture by the Dalai Lama uh, a few years ago, but, but as a stretch, uh, as I say. The, the alternative, if you like, the counter discourse to academic freedom is the wider notion of intellectual freedom. Recognising the fact that academic freedom can be, and often is, interpreted in a narrow sense as something applying only to academics or within disciplinary confines, uh, the NTU, which is a union for all staff, not just academics, um, established an intellectual freedom course in our enterprise agreement in the 2000s. Um, you may be aware that in the latest round of bargaining, University HR argued that the, the charter of academic freedom I was just referring to um, now made this clause redundant and they tried to remove it, something that the union strongly resisted. The university management relented on this quite easily, but they never talk about intellectual freedom. So, so what does that mean? Does that confirm that they prefer this much more narrow disciplinary concept of, of academic freedom. Um, unfortunately, if we want to know what people at the top of the university actually think uh, about these things, we're obliged to try to interpret um, the bits and pieces that they release as, as statements from time to time. Um, now, fortunately, Michael Spence gave a speech on censorship last year in Singapore. Uh, it's probably the most reliable guide to his views uh, on this topic. In principle, Spence does seem to prefer a disciplinary emphasis to academic freedom. Um, he argued here in this speech that, quote, justification for academic freedom offers strongest protection for an academic speaking within an area of expertise. Nevertheless, he immediately points out that for uh, secondary reasons, he's not going to enforce this distinction. Quote again, the chilling effect of attempting to define areas of expertise might be so damaging to the identity of a university as a community as a community committed to the unfettered pursuit of the true and good that it is not desirable to place weight upon that distinction. Now, this idea of academic freedom um, as primarily the freedom to pursue research with, with one's own discipline fits a certain vision uh, of the liberal university that sees the university as a collection of research silos that must be shielded from distorting influences, uh, in which scholars must be, uh, to quote again from this speech, uh, free from unnecessary interference in the pursuit of their understanding of the truth. It follows then that in order to fulfill this function, the culture or the structure of the university must equally exert no distorting influence on the silos that it contains. This is a position that the VC strongly endorsed uh, in Singapore. Um, the university, he said, and this is a rather long quote, so, so bear with me. 
The university ought primarily to see itself as a forum for hosting the development of ideas, rather than as an advocate of those ideas themselves. A university such as mine simply cannot have opinions if it is to retain its credibility as an institution in which academic freedom flourishes and which the social function in which we have seen such and which has the social function in which we have seen such value. For a secular liberal university to adopt a collective position on any issue is to betray the purpose for which it was founded and to break faith with the political and cultural traditions that have given it shape. End quote. Um, the university, in other words, should be a politically neutral shell. This type of formulation is appealing, I think, when management wants to be seen to avoid taking a position uh, on something. And I think the university likes to see its response to BDS uh, in these terms as avoiding taking a collective position on the Israel-Palestine conflict. We allow all, view all views to exist um, at our university. Of course, those who say that they're not interested in politics are usually just adopting someone else's politics. Um, Spencer's position amounts to dropping the institution's intellectual defences and letting mainstream politics, uh, in this case the Australian government's foreign policy, uh, dictate our stance. Uh, he's argued that, quote, I do not consider it appropriate for the university to boycott academic institutions in a country with which Australia has diplomatic relations. Refusing to endorse BDS is of course to take a position. It is to ignore uh, or to dismiss the unambiguous call from Palestinian civil society for an institutional boycott uh, of Israel. Doing so and pegging the university's policy to that of an extremely pro-Israel government is a highly political act. So in theory it's hard to sustain this idea of a politics-free university, but in practice they don't even try to sustain it. At exactly the same time as the Vice-Chancellor must have been preparing this Singapore speech, he was also writing emails to staff about what he termed, quote, the university's response to Christopher Pine's radical budget proposals last year. Now the first of these emails in May said that Quote, the university has not yet determined our final position on these changes, but he promised to keep staff informed of what he called the university's response. So, not only would the university have a position on this issue, its position was to be formulated without any involvement of staff, even those whose expertise was on higher education policy. This, to me, is an astonishing act of, of doublespeak. Um, to quote again from the Singapore speech, a university such as mine simply cannot have opinions if it is to retain its credibility. And yet, on Pine's once-in-a-generation reforms, the university would indeed have a position. It would be the management position of strong support for that policy. So I think we can conclude a couple of things from this. It seems that the university management prefers to limit its defence of academic freedom to the right of academics to research, teach and speak on questions of um, disciplinary expertise. It employs that discourse as part of presenting a false picture of the institution itself as value-free and apolitical. On certain issues, management uses this staff to absolve itself of responsibility to actively establish and defend the conditions necessary for the genuine exchange and refinement of ideas, the purported goal of the university. While on other issues, this allows the management to abrogate to itself the prestige and authority of the university's name to pursue its own eminently political objectives. How much time do I have? <laughs> the principle of academic freedom. So, the university cannot possibly be the apolitical shell of research silos that uh, Spence depicted it as uh, in Singapore. Uh, what are the implications uh, for this? And this is the last part of my talk. The principle of academic freedom, which university concedes, I think necess necessitates the intellectual freedom to, in to criticise university management publicly. Now, to return to Lomborg and the University of Western Australia, um, Scientists would be justified, I think, in objecting to the university's leadership for that decision. But it doesn't require a degree in climate science to see that the university was betraying its mission by taking the Lombard cash. So would only those scientists um, be justified in criticising the university? I'd suggest that everyone at the University of Western Australia and everyone in Australia 
for that matter, uh, has an interest in defeating that attack uh, on science. I think we're also entitled to ask that if the university is rhetorically committed to the free interplay of ideas as a means toward truth in the disciplines, then why should this not apply to the wider political issues that evidently do permeate the university? For example, who the university chooses to partner with internationally is an eminently political decision. By admitting Israel to that select group of countries whom we deem appropriate to sign MOUs with, um, to send our students uh, for study abroad programs, uh, and so on, we make a significant statement about our view of Israel and our willingness to disregard its barbaric treatment of the Palestinians. And, and finally, since the university is a political space influenced by the same political forces at work in, in wider society, I think we should abandon the myth of campus as a space with distinct discursive rules that can or should be codified uh, in a way that infringes on normal civil liberties. Now, if I as an academic go to a conference, I do in a certain sense sign up to some behavioural standards, not to heckle, not to be rude uh, or abusive to my colleagues, but even now I don't sign away my right to do so, should I think it necessary. A code of conduct that imposes an idealised notion of scholarly discourse on all on-campus activities with penalties for those who break it is a dangerous thing for a university. Recognising the desirability of full and free debate on all issues, as we do, the Code of Conduct should, I would suggest, be treated as a contribution to an ongoing debate, um, as how one section of the university, its management, would like staff and students to conduct themselves. But in the spirit of debate, we should be free to put forward alternatives to this, both in theory uh, and in practice. Uh, in choosing to disrupt the Kemp talk in March, that is what the students were doing. Um, I've suggested tonight that the liberal vision of the university involves the active bringing into existence of the conditions for the free exchange of, of viewpoints uh, and ideas. Um, we can perhaps best think of this not in terms of a set of rules, but a practice of prefiguring the form of intellectual exchange that would ideally occur everywhere uh, in a fair society freed from the distorting influences of class, um, race, gender hierarchies and the uneven distribution of political power. Now, and speaking of the responsibilities of the university um, tonight, I may have been guilty of allowing the word university um, to stand in for university management. Um, it hasn't been my intention to conflate those two things. This prefigurative practice that I refer to here is something that uh, we should all take responsibility for um, at the university. Through their actions, the students were saying to us that in a normal world, a world free from the distorting influences of Australian foreign policy, the Israel lobby, uh, a world liberated from an elite culture that is welcoming towards apologists for endless war in the Middle East, uh, and quick to stamp out criticism uh, of Australian militarism, or Anzac Day, the speech of someone like Richard Kemp would not be considered part of um, a world of polite scholarly discourse, but be met with vigorous opposition. Indeed, it would be met with derision uh, and disrespect. And in enacting that in microcosm uh, on campus, they were offering a model for wider society uh, on how paid propagandists for brutal state terrorism uh, should one day be received. Thank you. <laughs>